Thank you. I want to thank you all for coming too. Um, it's uh, many of you uh, we've known now for a long time. There are new faces here that we don't know. Um, it's humbling to be here uh, with you, and uh, I am very grateful for the gift of your attention and your time. Uh, it's humbling because what we're trying to do is something which is hard intellectually for us. Uh, many of us like things uh, in a box that we can see the beginning and the end of. Um, but this isn't. And uh, in a way I can, I can tell you why it's so important from the perspective of nuclear disarmament, which is our, which has been our central uh, work over the last, uh, you know, since 1989. Um, as you know, we worked very hard on preventing, however we could, the construction of a substitute facility for the Rocky Flats plant that closed in 1989. Now, Rocky Flats plant um, manufactures the plutonium cores of U.S. nuclear weapons, and uh, without that, uh, such a plant, the production rate um, and flexibility uh, of the U.S. for the U.S. nuclear arsenal is quite a bit constrained, and it has worked so. Um, our litigation um, was just enough to pause that project long enough, a year, so that the um, financial troubles, uh, that the Tea Party and its own financial troubles caught up with it. And suddenly it was, the NNSA realized, and the White House realized, gosh, we really don't need this after all. They adopted our analysis uh, and uh, to a considerable extent, and But through it all, there runs a current of mystery. And it's much less mysterious to us than it is to Congress and to the NNSA. Congress is still, to this day, deeply mystified as to what went wrong there. The, depending on when you start counting the original cost, the CMRR NF, uh, it, uh, to take the most conservative estimate is about eight times the original cost estimate, or if you really go back to when Congress really made a commitment to that project, it's about 16 times its original cost estimate. Why? How did this happen? What went wrong? Well, the GAO um, analyzed components of it. The lab told them, well, you know, 600 million because of excess seismic risk. We had to change the design because of uh, increased seismic risk. Um, and I think that's the number. I'm not a thousand percent sure that this removed. But there's a couple of billion dollars of unexplained cost increase. Where does that come from? Why? And if you do it on a per square foot basis, and if you go back in time and compare it to other facilities at Los Alamos, the cost increases for plutonium facilities run 30 to 50, 50 fold in real dollars, that's inflation corrected dollars, since 1978, since the last facility that was completed. It was, the cost per square foot was constant from 54 to 78, and then some between 78 and now, it went up by about a factor of 50. How could that be? What's going on? Those kind of cost estimates, if you, and they generalize across the nuclear weapons complex, not to that extent, but to a great extent, an order of magnitude cost increase is almost normal for an NSA. And then if you look at the tremendous investment that we are now facing, if this country is to deploy as many nuclear weapons as we do today, we have to replace the submarines, uh, there are 14 submarines on patrol now. Um, I think the idea is to replace 12, if I'm not mistaken. Um, the bombers, uh, the B-52s, were designed in the 50s 
1950s, and I think the last ones were built in the early 60s. Um, cruise missiles um, are believed uh, to be obsolete and will be dysfunctional, the current ones, um, in the 2020s, so there will need to be new cruise missiles. Uh, new warheads are planned for all of the above, and I use the term new advisedly, and not just uh, loosely. Uh, when you change so many things, you eventually have a brand new thing. And that's the plan, uh, is to create end-to-end -end work for the nuclear weapons complex on a, on a rapid enough clip to keep it busy at all times between now through at least 2030. But it's a lot of money. It's hundreds of billions of dollars in expenses to modernize all of those nuclear weapons. And I can say, I think with perfect confidence, that it's not going to happen. Not all of it. So we know at this point, if you look at, at one point, you look at the cost increases, and then you look at the projects which are in the pipeline. Uh, it now costs uh, six billion to ten billion dollars for a big box nuclear facility, as uh, as they are now called in Washington. Um, and uh, you just can't build very many of those. It may take fifteen years to build one, and there are many things that can happen in fifteen years. So the sum of all of this is the good news that the United States is now fully vested in nuclear disarmament. Uh, to a considerable extent, not nuclear abolition, but it's an absolute certainty that the present nuclear arsenal cannot be replicated under present or reasonably foreseeable future budget conditions. Unless, of course, they steal all of the Social Security, and uh, which they would like to do. Um, now, going back to that, Central mystery. There are major changes going on in our ability to deliver large projects in this country. What, and what's happening? What, what's going on? Well, we think we know part of the answer. We think that we don't, uh, for one thing, we don't think we understand what uh, inflation means in this country. Um, I'm always asking uh, people we know, uh, do you think that the um, official rate of inflation reflects a, your your household expenditures um, and your increases in household expenditures, and most people say they don't, it doesn't. Um, there is an inflation in everything we do which is amplified in complex, long-lasting projects. Um, and there may now be a level of complexity which this society cannot pursue. Um, I'm really very sure we could not go to the moon again. Um, now, why is that? What's happening to us? Um, we are we a can-do kind of society? Uh, to, um, so, I guess I want to. Uh, that was that's one way to start uh, talking about um, the limitations that we're running into, and I naturally um, one of those limitations is going to be time. So here we, uh, now you see the uh, difficulty of uh, the Los Alamos study group. It's like when we look at these, we, our little organization, we look at this type of mystery and it's like blowing the wall out of our house. Um, all of a sudden now we have uh, the entire horizon to look at and it is difficult to uh, conscientiously or correctly embrace topics of this complexity. Most parties that we interact with in Washington or here just don't even do it. So it's a complete mystery. We're like, you know, uh, things are happening to us that we just don't understand. So one of them uh, is peak oil. Uh, now there's an enormous, uh, enormous propaganda uh, effort underway, just to be completely blunt since time is short. Uh, to tell you that um, we're in the middle of an oil boom, that the United States could be another Saudi Arabia. Um, this is wrong. Um, it's factually wrong. And there are lots of people working on this who can tell you otherwise. 
One of them were, and I'm going to run through a couple of these very quickly. Um, because this, because we are in a petroleum age, right? Everybody knows that. We're not in an information age. We're not in a, um, we're in a petroleum age. Um, it's the central enabling fuel that, that can be injected into heat engines um, and made into stuff across our society. Um, it's very cheap. Um, and you can work it out for yourself how much human labor, uh, 25 cents worth of oil will buy you. Um, it, it's enormous. Um, just think of putting 25 cents worth of oil into a car and carrying a family or a ton of goods for a mile or two miles or five miles. And you see that it's a very cheap commodity and um, we are totally dependent on it. The, and I apologize for the just apologize all night, but um, I had to throw this together um, as fast as I could. The European Greens in the European Parliament put together a report in November, uh, Europe Facing Peace Peak Oil. And uh, we know some of these people. Here is their, um, probably the central uh, finding in their study of uh, world oil production. Um, we are at the top of an undulating plateau, and I don't know if you can see it very well, but that is a stacked graph with conventional oil at the bottom and um, various oil, new kinds of oil from uh, different, from geologic formations from which we have not gotten much oil in the past, shale oil, oil from shale. And um, and then there's uh, uh, other liquids stacked on the top. One of the things that's happening is that um, the oil definition of oil is now expanding to include anything that's liquid. <laughs> it can be possibly burned even if it isn't burned. The, what you should derive from this graph, which I invite you to consider as authoritative, um, until proven otherwise, uh, is that um, conventional oil, that's the oil that's relatively cheap to get from the ground, that bottom thing, has uh, become a decline. Um, and that is confirmed by the Department of Energy and <coughs> others. Um, you add in offshore oil, um, and you, you, know, you eventually get that thing stacked up to where You've got more or less flat at the top. But worldwide, that number is not significantly increasing. Whereas the population of the Earth is continuing to rise, and uh, there is a positive relationship between oil and GDP. Um, and so I, I am going to suggest to you that GDP is not going to grow. There, the top number is the total liquids production uh, since, at the top, rather, the red line, since 04. That's from the same report. And you can see there's really not a hell of a lot of difference. Oil production is flat. We're producing flat out. The taps are open. And so when the American uh, person buying gasoline says, why is the gas price going up? Well, it's because uh, some countries are buying more oil. That would be China in blue and India there in brown. Those are very large countries. And um, so in the space of 25 years, um, India and China's demand has increased about five-fold. And there are about 80 million new cars sold every year. About this year, there's expected to be 80 million new cars sold in the world. Uh, China's buying a lot of cars. And there's a lot of oil demand. The, uh, they can pay more for oil than we can because their society makes goods with less oil. So the, the um, oil efficiency of their manufacturing is greater than ours. So they can pay more for it and they can get more. And so we basically have, uh, if, if in a perfect market, uh, which it isn't, which there isn't, uh, we would have what's left. 
Uh, fortunately for US GDP and the Obama administration, US oil production has been rising. Okay, now. Shoot. Um, there, there is a very good, uh, we're going to put all these references on our website so you can look at this in detail because it's really, you can't possibly embrace this information in just a few minutes we have. Um, the basic, uh, what I think and a lot of people think is that the, there is a glass ceiling to any economic recovery that we might make. Uh, not even counting the, uh, the way that uh, inflation and GDP numbers are massaged and have been massaged ever since about 1980. Um, the, when the price of oil rises, the, there is less money available to put into the consumer economy and less goods and services are bought and so there, uh, there is a, a dampening of growth and there is a destruction of oil demand and so uh, what the New Economics Foundation um, has a pretty good report from November of last year, really quite good, um, looking at uh, what they call a glass ceiling, and others have called a glass ceiling to economic recovery. So the price of oil rises because there is growth, the economy is doing good, price of oil rises because the supply is flat. And then it reaches a point where uh, economic growth is retarded, then demand, then the price falls a little bit, and it vacillates in that way. Um, that of fluctuating oil prices what we have seen since, uh, since about 2005. And um, what the result of it is, um, is that we are unlikely to see economic growth in sport. And uh, the, this, their conclusion, which is also our conclusion, is right here, we have now reached the stage in our exploitation of fossil fuel resources where economic growth as we have known it over the past century has come to an end. Uh, the cost of continuing to increase our supplies of oil and gas has reached a level where recession has become endemic. Um, the, this is, the underside of the glass ceiling is the cost of producing this oil, whether it be from any of these new sources, the 30,000 foot deep wells in the, in the deep sea, the uh, digging up oil sands in Canada, um, all this is quite expensive. Um, and they see, um, looking at, now they take, they're taking cost analyses from the financial community and putting their analysis on it, and they see um, that the, what the economy can bear curve crosses the, what the oil industry needs to supply the oil curve cross in about 2015. Um, this is, um, about the same ballpark as the Joint Chiefs of Staff in their 2010 Joint Operating Report um, suggested would be um, a crunch time for oil in the United States. Um, these are just humorous, uh, that's a humorous graph of what uh, the BP oil company projected at one time. The blue line is what actually happened, but those are all the BP projections for various years. <laughs> um, so they're right on. <coughs> they're right on. This is the Canadian, well, Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers. Um, they have the same kind of, uh, you can find these all over the place. You know, we hear a lot about the mighty oil majors, um, Exxon, Shell, Total, and so forth. This is what they're actually producing in terms of oil. Um, dropping. Most of the oil is now produced by national oil companies, but you know, you don't see this on the evening news. Um, Exxon, for all of its money and all of its billions that they're throwing into finding and getting and producing and refining oil, is finding and producing and refining less and less. Um, now, this has led uh, economic analysts to talk um, in, some of them in rather sweeping terms. Tullet Preben is a large currency trading house in the city of London. And they published a report this year called Perfect Storm Energy Finance and the End of Growth. 
Their analysis is that two centuries of near perpetual growth have now come to an end and probably came to an end 10 years ago. Uh, but that's not apparent because they, like um, John Williams, uh, shadow government statistics, believe that um, our, our uh, national uh, economic statistics have been um, changed uh, for political convenience. So Tulip Treban, they analyze why this is, um, but, um, and I, we have to go very quickly. Uh, I wanted to show you this association between energy use and population, uh, which you should find scary. And this very important uh, chart right here with the little bubbles, uh, which we have to pause on because of this, uh, some of us with a physical science background, we like this kind of thing. Um, this is the um, is an estimate uh, by other parties, Charles Hall and other people, of the net energy that uh, produced per unit energy invested in different fuels at different times. The idea here is that society doesn't need just petroleum. You have our society consists of other things than just getting and burning petroleum. So if if that was your whole total aim of life, then you'd you know you'd be the you know Petro. We'd all be living in tents uh, in Midland, um, somewhere out there in Ozona or somewhere out uh, <laughs> Garden City, right? Uh, where there's a major Christian growth in Garden City, Texas, major fracking going on down there. Um, but in fact, our society runs on that surplus energy, on the energy which we get the profit. So um, this is a blur. I have to point it out one at a time. So that far one over there is hydroelectric dams. So you know you have a dam, then um, the sun raises the water, evaporates the water, falls on the mountain, and you and it, the dam requires very little energy input. The next one over are the oil and gas fines of the 1930s. Those are very easy. They're shallow, easy to drill, under pressure, just gushed out, right? Uh, coal uh, at the mine mouth is the next one. Coal is, um, the energy efficiency of coal is declining fast because we're mining lower and lower quality coal in general at deeper and deeper levels from thinner and thinner seams. But um, that's their, you know, estimate of average coal. Uh, efficiency. Now that way over there, this is still very close to 100% efficient, right? You're still getting, uh, that's about 100 to 1. You have to put in one barrel of oil drilled to well in the 1930s, and you get 100 barrels out. But once you get over to the 1970s there, you're starting to get, starting to have to put in, say, three barrels of oil to find and produce and refine the oil. So you, you is still extremely profitable in energy terms, but less. Uh, that is wind power. The wind, you know, there's a lot of steel and so forth in the in the turbines, and you have to invest energy to get energy. So that's there. Now then, you have current oil and gas funds, and then, and when you get over here, you're really looking at some right on that. Uh, elbow of that curve, it's hard to estimate these things. However, that next one is nuclear, and then we have photovoltaic uh, is the next one, and then way down at the bottom here, very inefficient, tar sands, biofuels, um, you know, ethanol is uh, really just a device to turn oil and coal into ethanol. The the take-home message from this graph is kind of twofold. One is that there is a sharp curve there in that graph, and we are approaching it. Um, we do not know what the minimum efficiency of a fossil fuel getting and using society must be. But we know that it is at least something like 5 to 1, 
Civilization needs not just oil, but it needs efficient oil. It needs efficient energy. And once it becomes inefficient, then everything that you want to do that's extremely complex, that requires a, a surfeit of easy energy, becomes difficult to achieve. Think CMRR. Um, at some point, you go over the cliff. And that is the point of the Tullet Preben report. They, this big currency trading house in London, this is not some bunch of hippies. They say that within 10 years, we are going to go too far on that, around that corner to be able to sustain uh, the growth of our uh, economy and that there will be no turning back because there are no substitutes for oil as a transportation fluid. Um, I can't really talk anymore about peak oil because we're out of time. Um, maybe just one or two more things. In case you didn't think oil was important, the, the, um, the green line, I think it's green, is the price of oil in Europe, and the red line is the price of food as indexed by the UN. So modern industrial agriculture uh, is tightly dependent on petroleum and the prices are very closely associated. Some of that is cross-investment and uh, speculation, but some of it is inputs. Then this very interesting chart um, uh, is a kind of a historical timeline of social unrest, Arab Spring. Um, you might uh, find on there. If you could read the fine print, I can barely see it. Um, but there are social revolutions and chaos when people cannot feed their families. And it only, it only makes sense. Cannot feed their families. When a man in Egypt is unable, he's got nothing to lose if he cannot buy bread. Um, a resource that perhaps if you really want to uh, go farther into this, you should, most of the good work is obviously in other countries, um, but uh, in Ireland, in Dublin, there is a very good economics group called FASTA, and a man, David Korowitz, um, has looked at uh, the effect of peak oil on supply chains. Supply chain problems are the problem with the nuclear industry. The big, probably the biggest single problem with the nuclear industry right now. And there are conferences about it um, with you know, quite some frequency. And Korowitz analyzes supply chain vulnerabilities to peak oil and, their, and its financial effects. Okay, I got to leave this subject, um, except to say that it's very big. It's very imminent. Um, the shale oil um, and shale gas bubbles um, to provide very little breathing room. Um, there is an excellent report that uh, you can find it at shalebubble.org by David Hughes, a 30-year um, veteran of uh, this oil and gas uh, analysis. He's a Canadian. Um, and Hughes, it extrapolates on paper he gave it to the American Geophysical Union um, recently, uh, but it's a completely transparent analysis from the bottom up and looks at the projected longevity of um, the so-called uh, energy independence of the, of the U.S., which is a complete non-starter. Um, because of this, we can't, uh, I think we should abandon the hope of uh, real economic growth. And that means that the banking system, which uh, requires this growth to service all debt, is faced with systemic crisis. Um, the systemic crises of the banking system very quickly become crises for everything. And, uh, and all of this happens on the same scale as the work, the normal work of the Los Alamos study group. So the construction of nuclear facilities, the replacement of submarines, um, the, the um, 
assumptions about tax revenues during the coming decade, which are the subject of debates in Washington. There are staggering assumptions of growth in the CBO projections for, um, that are going into the sequester debate, and which underlie the MNSA's, the National Nuclear Security Administration's proposed nuclear weapons budget. So we don't think that those CEO growth estimates will materialize. We think it's just complete BS. And um, that what all of this is a smokescreen for seeing how much money can be pulled from non-military discretionary uh, spending and non-military earned uh, Sort of earned, earned, uh, I want to try not to say, uh, um, well, what I mean is Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, VA, uh, big, big four, I guess. Um, the, those are uh, the people who run the nuclear weapons complex and the people who want to build 12 nuclear submarines are going to have to raid those sources of money because they're not going to be the economic growth that uh, in real terms. And it really, when you come, when you get to building submarines and CMRRs, it doesn't matter how much you, you massage the, uh, seat, the, con the consumer price index, you actually have to deal in real goods, in real steel, in real concrete, in real petroleum. And so then you see, um, you see problems that your uh, cost estimates have not predicted. And this has implications. <laughs> um, this hits us about the same time as we are experiencing uh, change climate here in New Mexico. Um, and this too has no clear end in sight. Uh, it is a uh, crisis without parallel in human history and we cannot ignore it. Um, it would be nice to think that merely running out of oil would cause the whole thing to crash down. It's not very nice really because we would all, everyone would suffer terribly. But um, uh, it's also quite possible that we could then um, cut down every tree, uh, mine every coal seam, uh, frack every seam. Uh, so that is the uh, dark possibility uh, that we have ahead of us if we, if, uh, we don't also care uh, and care in a very big way about climate. Um, those of you who were at a, we had sort of a climate teach-in in October, and some of you were there, and I'm not going to put those slides up now because we've run out of time, and I wouldn't anyway, but um, the, since we started talking about this at breakfast meetings uh, six or seven years ago, uh, the news has, by and large, all um, become worse. Um, and I would, however, like to draw your attention to um, Paul Gilding, uh, who is a, an author that uh, was not as active uh, six or seven years ago. Um, Paul used to be a director of Greenpeace, and then he became, uh, went into business consulting in you know, greening companies and so on. And then he taught at the, in uh, London, and he is now a consultant in Australia. Um, and his, uh, his book, The Great Disruption, is quite good, really. It is, uh, he has a very different temperament than your typical scientist, because he's not a scientist. He's a business guy. And he wrote this interesting article recently, Victory at Hand for the Climate Movement. And um, I commend it to you because um, it's very easy to get stuck in thinking in, the, in, a, in a certain way. Um, the gist of it is that an upheaval of this magnitude creates enormous business opportunities 
and inevitabilities. There are increasing um, financial penalties uh, being, uh, financial risk being uh, attached to uh, carbon intensive industries. Uh, banks are looking at them in a different way than they used to. Uh, and um, Paul thinks and we think that there are really literally billions of dollars um, in new business, uh, even billions over some years in the state. Um, Trish uh, looked up the other day what the um, current account balances in the various uh, funds that New Mexico holds uh, are, uh, and it's 15.4 billion we have in the bank here in the state. Um, and most of that is constrained in one way or another, but not all of it is really constrained. Even the largest, um, the land grant, uh, land, right, the, the ten million dollar home, right. right, the permanent fund. Yeah, right. it's the land sold. grant permanent fund. You're okay. right. Um, is uh, if you know, I don't, I don't see any barrier for schools and universities building. Renewable energy uh, facilities in the state um, under the terms of that, because that's what it's for, for the schools and the universities, and there's a list of institutions. The NIS is very familiar with it. Um, so, yes, we think there's, uh, and oh, and what goes along with having that much money in the bank is New Mexico can borrow money extremely cheaply. Um, I, I saw an article. Um, we, for a general obligation bond in New Mexico, were paying 1.1%. Um, that was perhaps six months ago or a year ago. Um, so this, the, the, the view of where from my desk is that all the poverty in this state, all of the lack of jobs, all the lack of investment in infrastructure, and the lack of response to climate change, and the lack of providing career opportunities for our young people, is all optional. That's all a choice. That's something that has happened because we don't have enough political um, aspiration. We don't have enough community responsibility. We don't have enough of a social contract. Um, and it's all there. Now, if you want outside capital to invest in this state, doing these things, in my opinion, uh, if you cover 20% of the cost, I'm sure you could get uh, private capital. It was a good project to cover the other 80. So I really don't see the problem here, except a lack of imagination, um, too much corruption, a lack of civic involvement. And I think that's, um, and that's one of the take home messages. Um, I know I've got to close. Uh, nothing, nothing is going to change by being really nice, by um, coloring within the lines, by doing the things which people, good, liberal, nice, nonviolent people have been doing for the last several decades. Uh, we look around the room here, none of us is uh, really, <coughs> there's one person who is Ethan. possibly <laughs> under 30, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Uh, but we're all, you know, what have we done? What is this generation, what, we have to do something different because we are basically um, our luxury and our lack of um, uh, puissance has been, um, is a burden, an intolerable burden on the earth and on young people. We have not we have dropped the ball. Now, we were all very well intentioned, yes, that's great. And those of you who come here tonight are, you know, way out on the upper end of the motivational curve. But um, we have to realize that the things that, the patterns that we have had in the past, the patterns of engagement, the patterns of activism, the patterns of reform, have not really been doing the job. And I would like to say that uh, after 20, uh, really 
started uh, in a serious way, full-time working on nuclear issues in 92, part-time before that, <clears throat> that the, really the biggest barrier that we have in, as I uh, institutionally, is the, is our willingness to go a little ways and then stop. That, uh, and the, uh, it's, there are always actors who perhaps, for one reason or another, most of them very well intentioned, who essentially form a screen that blocks the concern of citizens. This would be the nonprofit community, like, let's say, the Los Alamos study group. Well, I could stand here and say, give money to the Los Alamos study because we've got the answer. Um, you should write a postcard, you should um, come to a hearing and give your two cents worth at a DOE environmental impact statement hearing and the world will be a better place. But that would not be true. Um, and unfortunately, um, across the environmental movement, across the anti-nuclear movement, um, we have developed an unfortunate tolerance for what, uh, for faux activism or faux reform, or what one of our core members calls faux test. You don't go to the protest, you go to the faux test. Um, some of you saw the link uh, to John Stauber's article, uh, Is the Progressive Movement Just a Front for uh, Rich Democrats? Um, and the, the super title of that was Paid to Lose. I think that's quite accurate. Um, I think that's exactly what's going on. Um, we have nonprofits that are paid by the Department of Energy. We have, um, that's a so called anti nuclear. Um, it's very difficult to get, there's a, uh, the Democratic Party exerts a strong gravitational pull on almost the entire progressive movement. Um, the climate protest in Washington could really be seen from outer space as an Obama and Democratic Party uh, election party. The logo forward on climate is almost exactly the same as the Obama campaign logo. What is Obama doing? Um, we don't agree with the strategies of 350.org. We don't think that's anywhere near the tenor and the vigor with which this issue ought to be pursued. Uh, we don't think it's working. We think there's plenty of evidence that it is not working. And we're very afraid that <coughs> concerned citizens will plug into an organization and they, just like the hopeless dupes uh, that plugged into a spy agency uh, during the Cold War and the actual, uh, the people who actually know what's going on, who are actually doing the negotiating, who are actually deciding how it's all interpreted, are several levels up ahead and they are using the people down below. So they're using them to get grants, they're using them to put on a mailing list for the Democratic Party, um, and we are, we are, we have been unable to break out of those um, fossilized, or not fossilized, but of those forms. Uh, and so, for example, Ben Ray Lujan, who we might think was a liberal guy, and I guess he is in a lot of ways, um, you know, he, he voted against a, he's on the, he's a, voted against renewable energy pump, pump, pumping up, uh, the renewable energy account in the Department of Energy by more than $300 million. He voted against that amendment because that money would come from nuclear weapons. Um, now, why is that acceptable? Why is it acceptable that Mayor Cox will lead this town into providing money to lobby for Los Alamos National Laboratory? Why does Taos County do that? Why does the city of Taos do it? Why does the city of Española do it? I think that any anti-nuclear activism in this town or in this region had better start in dismantling the lobbying structure which has been put together by Democrats. And because that is, the, that is what they see. When we go to the Appropriations Committee in the House of Representatives, they say, the Coalition of Lano Regional Communities was here. What do you think about what they said? Blah, blah, blah. 
Um, that's who is speaking here. It's not, you know, people in, um, in Santa Fe that don't want nuclear weapons. It's professional lobbyists in Washington who say we do want nuclear weapons. And unless some, you know, that has to be changed. It can't, a structure like the, the Coalition for Atlanta Regional Communities can't be reformed. Its purpose is to get money for Los Alamos National Laboratory and whitewashing, greenwashing, whatever. So, okay, I've said something about rebellion, and I would, I think we need to talk to one another and have serious conversations about a permanent rebellion. Because none of this is going to stop all by itself. It'll stop when it encounters some kind of force. At the same time, that uh, rebellion does not encompass all, all of the roles that we might take. Stewardship. Uh, but we need to fight for a patch of, uh, of habitat that is the last of its kind. We've got to fight for it. It's a battle that will never be over, but um, those stewardship functions are essential. And we have to build resilience in our community so we can keep on doing this. And that means for those of us who are getting up in years, we need to get young people involved. And I, I gave this spiel in Albuquerque to the Great Panthers, and I must say that I'm disappointed that it did not go farther. It is not enough to do a little bit here and there, and to come to a meeting, and to be to think, okay, I'm doing the right thing because I have the right opinion. That is not enough. You, if you do not connect cause and effect, and you can't do it yourself because you have family responsibilities, or because you have um, health problems, or some other, you know, it could be anything. Your children could have health problems. Your parents could have health There are many reasons why we can't do everything that we'd like to do. But in that case, we have to realize that a full-time person on the ground is worth exponentially more than a volunteer collection of people who mean well but are no match for a powerful lobby operation. We need full-time people on the ground so that they can coordinate the work, the volunteer work, of the people that have only a few hours a week. And you've got to realize that we have got to go to that to that heavier footing. And the purpose of this talk tonight is really to tell you that that heavier footing, that warlike environment, that environment of unmitigated austerity is coming to us. It's coming to us whether we want it or not. And all we can do is decide how to direct it. We can decide whether we want to protect the vulnerable. We can and what kind of posture we are going to make in the middle of these great changes. We can't stop the changes, but we can respond to them. And, and I hope that, that we can reach a little bit deeper in our communities and in our organizations and find the kind of fire that um, we had uh, before this country became uh, so luxurious. I know I've spoken a little bit too long, so I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Greg.